All right, are we still on chapter one? This is tedious. I want us to be on chapter two already. So we've seen punctuation. We've seen various pieces of punctuation. There are those things. There are those things, right? What are these used for? Well, they're either used in mass statements to like force it to get done first, like x equals parentheses three plus two in parentheses, right? That kind of thing. Or they're used to group parameters when you're making a function call. Braces mark off areas of code, right? Semicolons are used to end statements. Commas are used to separate items in a sequence. And I just found out yesterday, and I should have taken a screenshot that you mailed me and updated, and I didn't. Is that your, if you're using the newer versions of Visual Studio, not this nice old version that these machines have, and you're trying to get the settings, you choose C++ and you choose Windows, but you don't choose Desktop. Instead, you choose Console. And I wish I had that. I wish I had a picture of it. I know that I got it in the, uh, the upload that you gave me. I'll find it and I'll put it there. Hopefully you've already found it. If you have not been able to create an application on your home machine because you couldn't spot that, let me know and I'll show you immediately as soon as I get your text. You can choose on those, on the newer ones, to go ahead and choose Win32 console and in which case you don't even need the boilerplate. On this version you do have to choose empty because if you choose Win32 console app it puts a whole bunch of extra junk in it that we don't want. But Microsoft kind of cleaned it up so that it's safe to do it if you're using Windows Studio 2018 or 2019. But as on campus, we're going to always create an empty project and put our boilerplate in it. If it's giving you an error, you may have to browse and pick a different directory. Look at the stupid directory it's defaulting to. So choose browse and pick something like in documents or something. You think that that would be better, but why don't we just click on Visual Studio already and then click OK and it probably takes us on to. Alright, if you try to create a Visual Studio project and it gives you an error, this is on this machines at school. If I did file new project, I tried to create an empty project, look at this path here. If it says something like C administrator, blah blah blah. Well, you don't have write access to the administrator directory. So what you're going to want to do is choose Browse, if that's the case, right? Pick Documents and find some better place to store. Like a good place might be in Visual Studio 2013 Projects, which is where it should have been defaulting to in the first place, right? I guess I'll do that. <laughs> All right, I'm going to grab my boilerplate, create a source file, and I'm just doing all this even before we start the lecture because I know that we're going to want to type along at a certain point. All right, so as always, I'm going to need my pound sign include and stuff like that, so I'm going to go grab boilerplate. Sometimes I just put it as a TXT file on the desktop so I can grab it easily like that. It's even faster than going to modules. Am I in like the Java class? Yeah, no wonder I'm not finding anything. Yeah, I'm definitely putting a copy of the boilerplate on my desktop to make it easy to find. All right. So anyways, what did I just say? Punctuation. Just putting a comment down here at the bottom. These guys enclose parameter lists and specify order of operation in math expressions. So like the POW function. We haven't used a POW function yet, but there is one. So if we wanted to take 
x equal to pow x to the power of 2. That raises x and squares it, right? Well, we use parentheses in order to do the parameter list. And if we did this, x is equal to 2 plus 3 times 5, it just forces this to get done first. Otherwise, the order of the rules of precedence that you probably learned in junior high or something says that multiplication would happen first, and it would have added the 3 to the 5 first. The multiple, it would have done that multiple. If it looked like this, right? If it looked like this, x equals 2 plus 3 times 5. If you type that into a scientific calculator, something more than the $10 one you got at Dollar General, it would do that part first. It would say 3 times 5, well that's 15, and then it would add 2 to it and get you 17. Rather than saying 2 plus 3 is 5, times 5 is 25. Now if you really wanted this part to get done first on one of those calculators, you'd have to put it in parentheses. And so that's the other part. It specifies the order of operation in a math expression. So what do curly braces do? Curly braces mark blocks of code. What about commas? Separate arguments in a function call. Or how about we just say function separate items in a list? For example, arguments in a function call. Well, what's an argument? It's one of these numbers inside the parentheses, right? We're calling the math function POW, and we're passing in x, and we're passing in 2. Those are two different arguments, so we had to put commas between them. Semicolons into statement. We can't just put them absolutely everywhere. There are places where it breaks the code if we do, but most statements end in a semicolon. This symbol, that symbol right there, we've seen that up here, creates what's known as, or marks what's known as a preprocessor command. Well, that's a fancy word. Begins a preprocessor command. Well, what in the world is a preprocessor command? Well, when we click that build button or the green button or whatever that starts it running, the compiler goes and reads the entire file, and then it starts turning into machine language or starts turning into object code. Simplification, but let's go with it. However, something happens even before that. The preprocessor runs and modifies the file according to the commands of the preprocessor, like this pound sign include. So what does pound sign include do? Is it goes and it reads that file into memory, right, and replaces that line with that file so that when the compiler goes, it can pretend that that file is part of this file. Well, there are other preprocessor commands. What if we did this? What if we did, uh, we're going to have to include some more. I need to modify my uh, boilerplate to include some other things. Include curly brace string in curly brace, because we're going to be using strings now. What are strings? The variables that can hold series of characters, and those series of characters are between double quotes. Well, that's a string, but it's a string literal. It's literally typed into the code. It's not a variable. Let's make a string variable, like string name. And then underneath that, we're going to do C out less than less than name less than less than ENDL. Now normally what I would do next is do something like this. Normally what I would have here is a statement where we set a name, like name equals quote Bob end quote. But just to show you another preprocessor, I mean a preprocessor command, I'm going to show you a different way of doing that. And that's to use pound sign define capital name space, double quote, Bob, in double quote, with no semicolons. See what I did there? Now this is certainly, I'm not going to put that as part of my boilerplate. I'm never going to do this again. But, and then down here, this line, I'm going to change it to use that macro. It's called a macro because 
when it runs, every occurrence of capital name gets replaced with quote BOB. So if I do this, it's going to print out Bob because this gets overridden with that. So pound sign define is another preprocessor command as, long, as well as pound sign include. And there's all sorts of preprocessor commands. I'm going to show you one that's absolutely ridiculous and we would never do it. But just for funsies, right now, I'm going to undo it later. Define output space C out. That defines a macro named output, and I could go and replace that word C out with the word output, and it now works. I'm kind of almost rearranging my language, right? Now, your coworkers are coming, you know, hit you with a rubber bat if you did that. But, uh, but you could. You could kind of write your own language. What if you hate uh, opening braces? Now we're getting really ridiculous. Pound sign, define, all caps, begin to mean open brace. Like that. And then I could put the word begin here, and it would serve that purpose. Okay, that's way too much. I'm going to start undoing these things. Certainly getting rid of that line. I think I'm going to get rid of output too. That was just to show you that you can do things like that. I certainly don't want to encourage you to do that. So I'm deleting the output macro and I'm changing these back to C out. Now this is really the only language I've used that lets you do that. Python doesn't let you do it. Java doesn't let you do it. C sharp doesn't let you do it to my recollection. It's kind of cool and it's kind of annoying. <laughs> Right? Somebody could redo the language. If they wanted to, they could redefine the plus sign to be the minus sign. That would be totally obnoxious, but okay. So, that's a macro definition, a preprocessor command, and that's what the hash does. There are other symbols, of course. There are the mass symbols. Plus, minus, multiply, divide, and modulus. Right? Those are math symbols where percent is modulus. You know what the other ones are, but I'm going to make a comment that says percent equals modulus. Modulus. Let's put the U where it belongs. Modulus. And that just means remainder. We'll talk about it later. I'm just listing symbols at this point. Because we've been using them to some fair degree, but we haven't listed them yet. Okay. We've seen these. Those are called IO insertion or stream, excuse me, stream insertion operators. And I'm never going to use that term again. All it does is it sends something to output or reads from input, right? But we've seen them. That, that's what those mean. Oopsie. Is that about enough? This means comment. And also, that thing, slash star, also means comment, right? It makes a multi-line comment that has to have a match down here of the star slash in order for it to work. A couple more that I'm going to add, and we're going to stop this list. There's an, a single equal, which is called the assignment operator, because it assigns a value. Example, x equals 3. It puts 3 into x. And then there's equals equals, which is the equality operator. It checks. It compares. Like if x equals equals 3. And they mean entirely different things. If you mix them up, your program's not going to work. And it's possible that the compiler will catch it, but it's possible that the compiler will not. In other languages, the compilers are much more rigorous about making sure that you don't make this mistake. Because I could make this mistake. Maybe I'll go up and even put it in code. I could come up here, and I could say int x equals 3. And then I could say if x equals equals 1, in parentheses, C out less than less than quote yes, backslash n, end quote semicolon. Now is it going to print yes? It shouldn't. I mean, it's because x is not equal to 1. It's equal to 3. So I'm not going to see 
it print yes? That's my goal, is to not see it print yes. And the pause command is right down there underneath it. Okay. But what if I made this a single equal instead? What's it going to do? It's going to copy that 1. It's going to erase x and put a 1 in it. So it's not going to equal 3 anymore. And I bet it is going to print yes, unless it flags it as an error. Yeah, see, it printed yes. It erased my value of x and then pretended it was true. So you never want equal equal. Uh, you never want a single equal. You never want an assignment operator inside of an if statement or a while or anything like that. If I go over here to my error list, hopefully I will see a warning. It's not even counting as a warning, even though it's tragically wrong. Well, what do you know? Okay. Make sure you use double equal if you're using ifs. Very, very, very important. Your code will not work otherwise if you, if you get that wrong. So here's our punctuation, our commas, our semicolons. Syntax. Those are the rules of grammar that must be followed when you're writing a program. I may have used this simile in here, I may not have, but in Spanish and French, the adjectives follow the verb. We would say that is the red dog. But in those languages, I don't know the terms, right, but you would say the dog red. But you know, you use the Spanish word for dog and the Spanish word for red. So, like if I do the red dog and I try to convert it to Spanish, where's Spanish? You think it'll leap out? There we go, right? It says el perro rojo, right? Because that's dog and that's red. Let's swap the order of them. And so if you walked up to somebody and said the dog red is hungry, they'd look at you crazy. Whereas in Spanish, if you went up to somebody and said el rojo perro, they might think that you're, you're kind of crazy too because you're messing up the syntax. Now humans are smart enough to be able to do that, right? If somebody walks up to me and mangles the syntax like that, I could probably figure out. But it's hard for computers to do that. That's why people earn the big bucks to make that, you know, hey Google and Siri and stuff like that, capable of understanding our mangled speech and the fact that sometimes we leave words out and we transpose them and stuff like that. It's actually a difficult process. Lang natural language processing is, earns people the big bucks. But that's just part of syntax. The fact is that some questions some languages need an upside down question mark at the beginning of the statement to indicate that it's a question. Ours doesn't. But if I wanted to type in a question in one of those languages, and I'm talking about you know human languages, not computers. You've seen the upside down question mark. I think Spanish uses it. Then uh, it's proper to have it there, and it's not proper for it not to be. But you know, if I don't do it correctly and I write down my question in that language and I forget to put the upside down question mark in front of it, the reader will probably go, oh, well, he's just a dummy, but I know what he means. But the computer's not going to go, he's just a dummy. The computer's going to give a syntax error because I left something out and not compile it. So the rules of syntax dictate the order of the keywords and the operators, things like that. What do I mean by that? If I do something like this, if I say x equals 7, that's good. If I say 7 equals x, well, algebraically it's true, right, if x equals 7. But it's invalid computer syntax. If we're using the assignment operator, the right-hand side is the expression that gets calculated, and the left-hand side is the variable that holds the results, right? So it's like holding your bowl upside down and trying to put food into it or something like that. It's not going to work. It's a bad syntax. Now, you're not going to hardly ever do that because we never do that in this class. Very rarely have I seen students mix them up like that and flip them. But if you do flip them, it's not going to compile. That's just a component of syntax. So that's bad syntax. Variable must be on left to assign. Now, it's not always a problem to swap things. If I did this, if 7 equals equals x, I'm just going to say do nothing. 
because I don't really care what it does, so I'm just putting empty quotes there. That's just as good as saying if x equals equals 7 because we're not copying a value, right? We're not putting x into 7. We're just checking them. And so that's like it doesn't matter if, you know, the two values are, you know, one's in the left hand or one's in the right hand. You can still hold them up and try to see if they're both equal. So that's okay. Either syntax works. Quite often, there's more than one way to write something. What do I mean by that? If I say if x less than 7, then do nothing. I'm just using empty braces to mean do nothing because I'm tired of writing little print statements. That is the same thing, perhaps, as saying if x is less than or equal to 6. Right, because what if x is 7? Is this true? Is x less than 7 if x is 7? No, it's not, right? Because how can you be less than 7 if you are 7? Well, the same is true of this, right? Is 7 less than or equal to 6? No. So logically, as long as x is an integer and that's a whole number, these two statements are exactly the same. That's just logically the same, right? So get in the idea of your head that quite often there's more than one way of doing something. Just a fact that, and sometimes the ways of doing them is a little more complicated, and sometimes they're a lot more complicated, and usually you're lo looking for the easiest one you know, the one that makes the most sense to you. But in some cases, I'll give you several different ways of doing something and you just pick the way you want. I don't give you the several different ways to try to confuse you, it's just because that they all work and I want you to see them and then I want you to kind of let them sink in and you know which one you want to pick. So a variable is a name storage place in memory, like x is a variable. I'm gonna write some comments about variables down here. A variable is a named place in memory that holds data. So I'm going to be more specific about it. What are the components of a variable? A variable has four components. It's got an address, a name, a type, and a value. Now, we usually don't care about the address. The compiler picks the address. When I say int x equals 7, it goes and it picks an address to store the x variable in, and I don't really care usually. But if I need the address, I have the ability of doing so. If you recall last lecture, I talked about pointers. And pointers, you can get the address if you want the address if you need the address for some purpose. And this language and the C language are pretty special to that effect. Most languages don't let you get a hold of the address of the variable. And the reason for that is, is that operations where you're trying to write directly to a memory address are kind of inherently risky. You can, try, you can you know, get into shenanigans, purposeful or otherwise. And so a lot of languages that came out after C++, like Java and Python and C Sharp, don't let you do that. But see here, after I've done so much with 7, I could print out x, and I could also print out its value, its address. So see out less than less than the value of x is, end quote, less than less than x, less than less than ENDL. And then I'm going to copy that line and paste it and change the word value to address just because it's faster. All right, I'm going to copy that entire line. Copy, paste, change this to address. But to get the address, I use that ampersand. That tells me the address of x. What if I had a different variable, like y? I'm going to make a new variable called y. Int y equals 3, whatever, right? And then I'm going to copy these two lines, paste them, and change all the x's in them to y's. Because I'm interested in the same thing, its value and its address. So I'm going to highlight those two lines. And by the way, I usually do uh, keyboard shortcuts to copy is control C, and to paste is control V, is in vehicle right next to it. So that's what I did there. Just faster. 
And so the value of y is that, and the address of y is ampersand y. Let's run it. As long as I don't have any syntax errors. All right, so the address, the value of x is 7, because that's the last thing we set it to. And its address is this hexadecimal number. The value of y is this, and the address of y is a different number. They're stored in different places in memory. They're kind of close. We could figure out how far apart they were if we wanted to. No real point. It's one of the four components of a variable. Its address, its name, its type, and its value. We get to pick the name. The name follows certain rules. Did I talk about that last time, how names can have digits, but they can't begin with a digit? Does that sound familiar? OK, right. So that's a rule for what a name, variable name is. And the type dictates what can be done with the data, what kind of operations work on the data. Like I can add a number to an int, but I can't add a number to a string. I can't say name equals name plus 3, right? He doesn't know what that means. Name is a string of letters, quote, you know, B-O-B, -B, end quote. How could I add three to it? What am I doing in that case? I could do this. I could say, OK, go ahead and append a three to it. That's called concatenation. And that works now because both of these are strings. But the type of the variable, which way up there we declared as a string, dictates what kind of operations can be done on it. If it's a numeric type, we can do math on it. If it's a string, all you can do is concatenate things to it. You can't divide one string by another, right? Or, you know, multiply two strings together. Because what would it mean? Multiply Fred times Barney. I don't know what that would mean. So when you define a variable, you can define multiple variables at the same time, separated by commas, as long as they're of the same type. Right, my program earlier apparently used three variables and declared them all at the same time. Now, I don't usually do that because I like to be able to do this. Int h equal and then semicolon less than, uh, I am not talk talking correctly right now. Int space h semicolon slash slash height in meters, right? An int w semicolon slash slash weight in kg, right? I would not be able to add these comments if I had done what they were suggesting, int h comma w, right? How would I add the comments? I wouldn't be able to. So quite often, I will list the elements separately like that. But it's totally legit. You could do that, right? Int x, well, we've already got x, you know double D1, comma D2, comma D3, whatever. That works just as well, but they all have to be of the same type. When you define a variable, you can also give it a value. It could say int W equals 80, right, or 80 kilograms, and int H equals 1.7. That's called initializing. I'm assigning a value to it as it's getting created. If I don't assign a value to it, it's got some kind of garbage in it. What do I mean by that? Some languages, when you create a variable, it just gets a value of zero. Not this language. You see these three values down here, D1, D2, D3? Since I haven't initialized them, if I try to write them out, C out less than less than D1 equals end quote, less than less than D1, less than less than ENDO, you might think it should be zero because there's no data in it. Ooh, it may not even run. Is it going to tell me that it's an uninitialized variable? OK, in this particular case, thankfully, C++ is not allowing me to do that. It recognizes that that thing has no data. But there are lots of times when C++ will miss that. And it'll go ahead and compile it. And it might give it a little yellow warning down here. But we don't normally check all of our warnings. See, I'm, I'm getting errors down here anyways. I mean, warnings down here anyways, and I hadn't been checking them. So that's not going to work because it is not initialized. So D1, D2, and D3 are uninitialized. 
they can't be used until a value is assigned, right? So then I could say d1 equals 3, d2 equals 4, and d3 equals 5. I'm just making up numbers, but right? Now I could use them. Now I could write them out or add them up, right? d3 is equal to d1 plus d2. That all works. Couldn't do that if these were, were gone, right? How could you add d1 and d2 together if they didn't have any values? So if you assign and create at the same time, that's called initializing. If you assign a value as you declare the variable, that's initialization. That's initializing. That's the strict definition of initializing. But as we talk, you know, I may make the mistake of calling something an initialization if I'm not, right? Like I may say, okay. And now here we initialize the value to 7, but we've been using x all throughout, so it's not strictly correct to call it initializing. I should say assigning. It's just too easy to do. But strictly speaking, initializing is the first time you do this. Is this an initialization? Yes, because we're assigning the value as we create it. Is this an initialization? No, because x already had a value. It already had an initial value. So it's just an assignment. This is called a declaration, that right here. A declaration is when you name a variable and you give it a type. Now we've done lots of examples on that. Int x, that's, an, that's a declaration, right? Double h, that was a declaration. Many types of data. Each variable holds a specific piece of data, or it might hold a, an entire list of data. The variable definition specifies the type of data that the variable can hold. And the vari so it's by specifying the type, you're saying what kind of data it holds. If it's an int, you're saying this variable holds whole numbers. Input processing output. You usually do these three steps in these introductory programming courses. You get input. You process the input data and you display the results as output in that order, right? We ask the user, how many kilograms? We do the conversion to pounds and then we print that out. Or it could be a little bit more sophisticated. We could get our input from a file, right? Like specify file name and we type in a file name. It opens that file and it reads in all the data. And then it does something to it and it displays the report, that kind of thing. The programming process. This is one of my favorite silly slides of all. Clearly define what the program is to do. Well, that sounds good, right? I want you to write a program that's uh, you know going to add two numbers together. I told you that. I clearly defined it. This is my favorite silly. Visualize the program running on the computer. Okay. I'm visualizing the program running on a computer. I have positive intentions. This is going to work. That's kind of blue agey, right? No, no. Yeah, yeah. That's right, exactly. <laughs> no errors. Use design tools such as hierarchy charts, flow charts, or pseudocode. Now, this isn't 1113, so we're not going to be talking about this much. Every once in a while, we'll see a flow chart. But I'm not going to make you draw flow charts in this class. Okay, you complained, I'll make us do it. No, I'm kidding. It's a, usually people hate flowcharts anyways. Check the model for logical errors. Type the code, save it, and compile it. Correct the errors found during compilation. And then run the program with test data for input. And you keep testing more than once because not only are you trying to test it to see if it's successful, you're also testing to see if the, you can make it not be successful. You give it bad data. Like, what if it was supposed to do something if x is equal to 30 or less than 32? 
you need to figure out for yourself what it was supposed to do if x was equal to 32. Should that comparison have been if x less than equal to 32, or was it good enough to say x less than 32, right? So you need to test those boundary conditions and have your definitions good enough to figure it out that you would know how it's supposed to behave at that edge, right, that 32. And then you correct your errors and you keep repeating steps 5 through 8 until it's good. And then you send me the file in the snapshot, right? Procedural and object-oriented programming. Well, object-oriented programming is a huge topic. It's certainly bigger than what we can do in one slide. But procedural programming is what we're doing with first. We write a function, like a main function, and it does a thing in a series of steps. Right? And so it's kind of top-down programming. I'm going to go here, and it's going to do this, and it's going to do this, and it's going to do this, and then it's going to be done. Whereas object programming is not based on pulling in little pieces of data and then manipulating them in order and then producing a result. It's defining objects, which are groups of data. You might have a patient object, and that patient has their first name, their last name, their address, you know, their social security number, and their phone number, that kind of thing. It's a cluster of information. And then if you want to, you can save that entire object to a file so that the next time you need to read their patient data and you just read it in and it all comes in as one group. So you're defining an object which is a collection of data and you're defining the functions that can use that data. And we'll be doing that but not at the beginning. When we do that it'll be called creating a class. Now we're using a class right now. We're using the string class. But that's about the only class that we're using at this specific moment. That's not strictly true. We're also using CIN and COUT. But let's go and take a peek here. If I did this, string S semicolon, and then I did S dot, it shows a whole bunch of things I can do with a string. I don't even know what half of these do. I don't know what two-thirds of them do. There's a whole bunch of commands that can be done on a string. But if I do this, int i, and then type in, well, I better get rid of that, it's not compiling, i dot, it doesn't pop up a list of commands. That's because an integer is a primitive data type. A primitive data type is just a pure number. S is an object created for object-oriented programming. So it contains not only data, which is the characters, but things you can do with the data. We will learn a lot more about writing classes, but not right now. And I believe that's the last slide. Yeah, I believe that's the last slide. I'm going to go check something. All right, the parts of a C++ program. We've seen these before. Things that are marked with that are comments. Things that are marked with that are preprocessor directives. Let's get as fancy as possible in our speaking, huh? And these just get done before the program is compiled. So it goes and it grabs that file and it inserts into our other file in memory so it can be compiled. This using statement, now I'm not going to even explain what a namespace does right now, but I'm going to show you what it does. If I left that out, if I did not have this statement here, then when I tried to run it, it'd give me there are build errors. And what I would have to do to fix it is every one of these errors I would have to come and fix by adding std colon colon in front of it. I don't feel like doing that, so I'm going to put that statement back, right? Makes all the errors go away. If you look at code on the internet, you're going to see code that uses std colon colon c out. Don't be confused by it. Just know that you don't need to do it because you've been, that, you've been adding that to your code. It doesn't hurt it to have it there, but it's not necessary. It makes the code lo longer to type in. It kind of clutters it up, and so that's why we go ahead and do that. So I could go back now and remove those. Why would anybody not put the namespace first? Why would they put... It brings in a lot of things. 
That's a very good question. Why not do that as a matter of course? It's because the lots of things are defined in the STD namespace. And some people just like to make it very specific about what they're using from which namespaces, because you can have more than one namespace. It could be that you have something in another namespace that was also named STD, and so you'd have two conflicting definitions. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So some people say, don't do this. A real programmer doesn't do it using names. Well, we're going to do it because it makes it easier to type. And then if we ever found you know, a, a, a situation where it didn't work, then we would worry about it then. Could you define the ones you wanted to use? You can. If you have two different namespaces with the same thing, namespace Bob. Bob has an age. Int age equals three. Namespace Fred. He has a different age. If I want to print those out, I can specify them by their namespace. I could see out less than less than Bob colon colon age less than less than EMDL. And then I could see out Fred colon colon age less than less than EMDL. So if you do have namespace conflicts, if you have STD defined in multiple namespaces, you can always specify which namespace it is, what part you're getting out of what. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. And the that, syntax that are in blue, those are classes? I am so sorry, pardon? And the ones that are in blue, are those classes? Um, everything that's in blue is a keyword. Oh. The only class we've used so far yeah. is name, right. C out and C I N are objects mm -hmm. that are made from classes. So they do object-oriented programming as well. But the only class type we've been using is a string. I'm going to get rid of that. Get rid of that. Y'all ask good questions. Thank you so much. So to define a function, you give it a type, you give it a name, and then you give it a pair of parentheses. That's the difference between declaring a function and declaring a variable. In my code, whenever I declared a variable like that, I didn't put parentheses after that. But when I'm defining a function, I do. And a function is just a named block of code. This is a great big block of code that has the name main. And I can write all sorts of functions and give them all sorts of different names. Oh, somebody asked me, can I just keep modifying my file rather than uh, create a new project for each homework I do? And you could, and if you were going to do that, what I might do, or what I might suggest is like, if this was homework one, when you were ready to write homework two, you might say this is main for homework one, and then go and add a new main for homework two, right? And now this one's not run anymore because it doesn't have the right name. So that's one way to stick multiple homeworks into a single file. I really don't see any reason to do that, and I don't mean that pejoratively, but I'm not telling you to do that, and I'm not recommending you to do that. And it could be kind of cool, perhaps, to have all your source code in one file. On the other hand, it, it's going to become pr a pretty long file pretty quickly. But for the person who asked how to do that, how to put multiple homework assignments, that's one way to do it, is you just rename your main to something else so that you can create a brand fresh new main and go on from there. That makes sense? Yeah. Is there a way you could do different sources in the same project? Yes, you can. That's why we have the Solution Explorer. The question is, can we add different sources into the same file, into the same thing? I could go and do add new item and create a different file. But then if it's got a main in it, now when I compile it, it's not going to compile. It's going to say, you have build errors, and if I go and I look at it, what the build errors are, it's going to say that main was defined multiple times. And so trying to put multiple homework files in the same project is going to give you that error. The way you would fix that error is to go and rename the main in, this, in the first file to something else to let it compile. Let's get rid of that. Don't want that.
Can you just remove the source you're not using? Yeah, but by then, why don't you just make a new project? That'd be my recommendation. I recommend making a new project for every homework assignment, unless you have a good reason not to. I'm not saying they're not, I'm just saying I don't know why. Okay, I can think of reasons why I would want to do it. What if in <coughs> homework three I come up with a cool bit of code that asks for input and it converts it into another format that I find really useful? And then when I'm writing program four, hey, that was really cool. I wish I had that. Well, one answer is you can go and copy it and paste it into this, right? Another is that you could stick it in another file and include it into both projects. The third is that if you kept using the same project, you would build up that library of stuff that might be useful from one homework to the next. So I can see a reason why you might. So the special characters, we've already talked about these. The only ones that I mentioned, forgot to mention are double quotes, which mark off a string. Unlike Python, you can't use single quotes, apostrophes, to mark off a string because those mark off characters. What's the difference? Well, a character is just a single character. It's just a single typewriter press. So you can't put single quote apostrophe and then have more than one letter in it. It's good only for one letter. Double quotes are for qu quotes of strings. The see out object displays output on the computer screen. We've been doing this already. So I'm not going to spend a little more than two seconds. Notice that they give the fancy name for the greater than, great, the less than, less than, the stream insertion operator. Why is it called that? Because it inserts that text into the output stream. An output stream, that's a fancy name for it, but there's more than one kind of output stream. You could write data to a file just as easily. You have a different word here that meant your file, and then you put program in this fun less than, less than file, and it would write that out to the disk rather than displaying it on the monitor. You can send more than one piece of data in the same line, right? See out less than, less than hello, less than, less than there. Or you can do it two in a row, right? See out less than, less than hello. And then the next statement, see out less than, less than there. So back into main. I could do this. C out less than less than my name is space end quote semicolon. C out less than less than quote slim shady end quote semicolon. C out less than less than quote exclamation mark backslash in end quote semicolon. And now it's going to print out my name is slim shady. All on one line. Why is it all on one line? Because there's no E and D L's and there's no backslash N's, right? So when it runs, we're going to see my name is Slim Shady all on one. No, we're not. How about we fix the problems? Then maybe it'll work. Oh, that's a that's a mistake. What's this mistake here? I declared this variable as an int, which means whole numbers. And what am I trying to store into it? A number with a decimal point. So rightly so, it's giving me a warning that that was pretty dumb. So I'm going to just type in a 2 there to get that to go away. What else? I know I've said this before, but please never hit do not show this dialog while clicking yes. All righty. Main must return a value. I wonder why it's not returning a value. Oh, I forgot to change it back to just int. All right, so if you did that thing, if you renamed main during all that babbling, please change it back. Now maybe it's going to work. All right, and so see, it says my name is Slim Shady up there at the top because there's no backslash ins and there's no E and DLs. If I wanted to, I could put a backslash in there. And then it's going to say my name is, on one line, Slim Shady. Or you can use backslash in for the same purpose, or ENDL for the same purpose. I could, after the quote but before the semicolon, do less than, less than, 
EMDL with no quotes around it and no typos like I was just making. And this says send an end of line. It's the exact same thing as if I had done this. I don't think there's any difference between doing that and doing that. Mm -hmm. And so now, whoops, that was dumb. That was supposed to be NDL. Now it's going to print my name is on one line, Slim Shady on the second, and an exclamation mark on the third. So this would print out, programming is fun, all on one line, and it wouldn't go to the next line because there's no backslash in and there's no ENDL. So unlike Python, an output statement does not automatically go to the next line like the print statement does in Python. I like the fact that it calls this a manipulator. It sounds so sneaky. It's being manipulative. The ENDL manipulator goes to the next line of output. So programming is, end of line, fun. So when we run it, it's going to say programming is, hit the enter key, fun. Like that. But strictly speaking, there should have been an ENDL on that line as well. Or else the next scene that prints is going to be right after the exclamation mark. So you don't put quotes around ENDL. And that L is a fact, an L and not a 1. You can use backslash n to do the same thing. Now when do I use one, when do I use the other? I use backslash n if I'm already inside a double quote. If I'm not, if I'm printing out a variable like that and I don't have a double quote going on, I'll just go ahead and do ENDL. You could make the decision that you're going to use backslash n every single time or that you're going to use ENDL every single time. It's up to you. However you want to do it, as long as it works, then you got it. Remember what I said? There's always more than one way to do something. The include directive that inserts the contents of another file into this one. It's called a preprocessor directive. It's not even part of the C++ language. And so any language like Java or Python or whatever could have added support for pound sign include. But they didn't. Instead, they added the import command, which does something kind of similar, but not really. And so what happens is the preprocessor goes and it does all these cuts and pastes and replaces and including and stuff like that, and then it hands the results of that to the real compiler. That's why it's called preprocessing. You don't place a semicolon at the end of the include line. On the other hand, it wouldn't break it, most likely. I think I could get away with putting semicolons there, and it would still work, but it's not proper. So I'm not going to do it. It doesn't break the code. I'm not going to do it. There are places where it would break the code. If I got into the habit of being obsessive about putting semicolons everywhere, this would not be a good thing to do. Because then everywhere name occurred, there would be a semicolon. Maybe it would work, maybe it would not. But it would define that semicolon as being part of that name macro. Don't want that. Variables and literals. A variable is a storage and memory, location and memory. I already talked about it. It's got four parts. It's got a name. It's got a type. It's got a value. Right now the value is undefined. It's still got an undefined value. And then it's got a memory address. The, two thing, the three things we care about most often are the name and the type and the value. So a literal is a value that's written into the program's code. It's literally typed into the code. Not when the program is running, but when it was written. So that's a literal. It's, it's hard-coded into the program. You'll hear me say that sometimes. It's hard-coded into the program. What does that mean? It's something that the user can't change. They'd have to ask the programmer to change it. Or if we gave them the source code, they could open up the, the file and change it. But they can't change that name, Bob. Nor could they change that 3. Nor could they change that 4. These are all literals. They cannot change my name is, or they cannot change Slim Shady. And if this program was supposed to be run in French, then uh, it'd be kind of a drag. They would not be able to change these phrases to French phrases. And there are ways, you know, to try to make your program easier to, uh, to do those translations. 
I've already forgotten what you would call that, localization, making a program so that it can be modified to you know, run in different languages. We're not doing that. But all of these are literals. All of these are hard-coded values. And if you have a hard-coded value, sometimes you want to put it into a constant if you're going to use it over and over and over, like the value pi. You can get pi from the C programming language, but if not, you're going to want to make a constant to hold it. Const space double space pi equals 3.14159, and you could type in more digits if you wanted to. Now, why did we make it a const? so that we can't be an idiot later and say pi equals pi plus one. We should not be trying to change the value of pi, right? Because if we're calculating the radius of the sphere or something like that later on, we really need it to equal that value. And so if some other programmer thought that they could go in and change that value, use it for whatever purpose they want, it's gonna break our code further down. So things like that are trying to save you from yourself or to save yourself from other co-workers, right, to stop people from making mistakes. If we define this as a constant, it can't be changed while the program is running. The only way it can change is if somebody goes in and edits that. So you want to use constants for things that are used over and over in your program, but need to be put in a variable that shouldn't change while it's running. Like maybe the tax rate is going to stay the same while the program is running. It's never going to change. You can make it a constant. Maybe the length of a file name can never get more than 32 characters. We could put that in a constant. And then later on, if it turns out that file names can be longer than that, you could go and edit it. But at least you'll be changing it in one place rather than the 132 different places you might be referring to the maximum length of a file name. What if everywhere I needed pi, I typed in 3.14159? Well, I might make a mistake, right? I might transpose the one into four or something like that one of the times I typed it, and so that calculation is wrong. And you also probably know that pi is an infinite number, right? And so that's not very precise. You may want a more precise version of it. So you tell me I want it to be more precise, and I go, oh no, I had 170 different places where I put 3.14159. If you define it as a constant variable, you just change it to one place, and then it gets picked up everywhere else. All right, we're about done for the day. We're going to have kind of a silly assignment. Not that silly, but here's what I want you to do. Write a program that displays a limerick or verses from a song or the like. If you feel like doing like the first stanza of the Declaration of Independence, whatever. Right? Using C out. That's all I have to do. Right? So, you know, you like Pink Floyd and want to do some of the lyrics for Comfortably Numb, go for it. Right? You know, or if you feel like getting a limerick, just don't make a two-up scene and put it in there, and that'll be it. That's all you got to do for this one. Do use C out. But I don't want it all on one line, right? Because a limerick's supposed to be five lines long. And most songs have more than one line. Don't, don't get sneaky and put an instrumental in there and just put no lyrics. All right, there's a Dropbox for this. You can upload your notes if you took any notes. Otherwise, you can just, you know, type in, I was here. Are there any questions? We do have a couple minutes, so if you're stuck on a prior homework assignment, we can talk about it. So people say, What, open, source code is open yeah, open source code means that you can download it from the internet onto your own machine and you can make changes to it. And some open source licenses say that if you use their open source code, you're not allowed to charge money for it. Right? You can't just take their program, make one change to it, and sell it. That's a specific form of OGL license. But yeah, open source is really cool because program's not working the way you need it to, you can fix it. And then you're supposed to publish the fixes back out there so that other people can fix it as well. I mean, can, can take advantage of that as well. 